to Locked On Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H Town Wheelhouse Chancy. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Talk Astros. You can find the show at Locked On Astros, your team every day. Brett, where can we find you at? They can find me at H Town Wheelhouse on Twitter and at Strohs411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Strohs. All right, y'all call me Eric the Man Heisman. We're here with the man, Den Man. Uh, where can they find you on Twitter? You can find me at Moose Out Front on Twitter. Great to be here live with y'all. All righty. So uh, we got a great show. I know the Astros had a bad weekend. Well, not a bad weekend. I guess a bad Sunday. I guess that makes uh, for a bad weekend. We all remember what we saw last. And I guess that's what we're going to talk a little bit on this podcast. Uh, we had uh, Alex Bregman return this weekend. Uh, a lot of good things to talk about there. We have uh, Jordan Alvarez looking uh, like an all-star again. And he's up to 28 home runs. There's a lot to talk about on this podcast. And uh, it, I'm sure we're going to hear our friend Sully talk about the Astros a lot on the Lockdown MLB podcast, and he is on uh, YouTube as well. And go and subscribe to him and the Lockdown Astros podcast. We're on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast, go um, go listen to that, whether it be Apple's uh, Odyssey, wherever you listen to your podcast, listen to the Lockdown Astros and Lockdown MLB podcast. A lot to listen to. So, uh, we, Dim, uh, you had a special honor this uh, past um this, this, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago, where uh, your grandfather, Judge Roy Hoffines, was inducted to the Astros Hall of Fame. What, what did that mean for your family? Tell you what, it was, it was a, a it was an out of body in many ways. We, family members there, we, we, my mom, did an amazing job, and that was the part that mattered the most to me. Eight years old, and got a chance to go down to that field and represent her father. So it was just an outstanding event all around. The folks at the Astros to the other players, the players who were in. I mean, you're sitting there, and, and you're just like, okay, my grandfather's going in, but I'm right next to him, and I'm right. And there's Billy Wagner, and here's Sedania, who I grew up watching and son was there and Bob Watt's widow was there and they were lovely people. Lance Berkman, of course, was there. And then he had a COVID thing going on with the family and, and, uh, but you know, it, it was just a great family experience and not just family from a standpoint of my own flesh and blood, but the Astros family, they did, they put on an amazing, amazing effort. And it traces all the way back to when I first got the phone call from Reed Ryan, how much it meant to us that, uh, that that was going to occur. So yeah, it was a blast. And, they won, and it's and they gotta be the special. They won the game. That was the one game in the in the four game series that they won was when they did the induction. That was a rough weekend otherwise against the twins. Yeah, and that's gotta be a special honor for you, just knowing that this is this was your grandfather, and maybe it was kind of a long time coming. I know the Astros Hall of Fame was something that came about later on, so it's not like it's been there for a long time. But like you said, to be there with Astros legends, you know, I remember growing up in the Astrodome for me, the Astrodome was my home away from home. That was where you connected with Jose Cruz and Craig Reynolds. And you saw all these other players and, you know, my favorite catcher, Alan Ashby growing up before Craig Biggio came up, just so many memories in the Astrodome and um, your, your grandfather more than the Astrodome, had a lot to do with U of H and other things, just a huge name in Houston sports history. It is. And it was a you know, great honor. I always, I always just knew him as my grandfather to, for the most part, except you knew he was uh, pretty special. And when we'd go to restaurants and people would point and whisper. And so you're kind of getting the feel for, for the mini paparazzi that we had down in Houston at that time. But, you know, he did so much off the field and outside of the ballpark that the, that the stadium itself you know, while it set the set the stage and base modern stadium that ever just played in, um, from the to the amenities to the restaurants to the variety for fans, so that the stadium itself could be part of the fun. Uh, you know, it's just magnificent. It's a it's a it's a terrific legacy, 
And, you know, the fact he didn't get in the first class, he got in the second class, it was almost like, I don't know, some, some bizarre poetic justice that it was a two-year celebration because of the first year no fans were there. So he really got to be honored over the course of a two-year period, um, which kind of his way of you know, showing everybody that, okay, you know, let, let me have a two-year celebration. And it also allowed for J.R. Richard to get in that first class. And a lot of people didn't realize the way they constructed the first class and it was they wanted players from every decade. So they wanted to open up with a bang and sort of have players across all these different decades. So, you know, guys like Shane Reynolds, other players, who, you know, who got in, who maybe people said, okay, first class, really? That's, that's the group? Yeah, because the guys represented certain decades. And so it was a thrill. It was a great time, and it was great to see Biggio and, and Bagwell and so many other folks. So uh, I'm assuming you got to actually experience uh, some of the amenities in the Astrodome, like maybe the bowling and everything like that. I did, I did. I did not bowl 300 on that on that little little lane. There wasn't much of a walk up to that lane. It was sort of, my grandfather wasn't didn't do a whole lot of research on on the bowling alley and how that should have been constructed because there was like a step up and like a little piece of astroturf that was almost the you know, half the size of a batter's box where you would bowl the ball. So you almost bowled from a standstill. But there was miniature golf that circled that thing. Um, the one, it didn't have a half-court basketball, which is really disappointing. You know, that would have been, that would have been a, another, another extra touch. But that week when I came down for the celebration, I got to go up into the penthouse of the Astroworld Hotel, which a lot of people don't realize is still basically intact. So I went back, I went in there, and it was just this mind-blowing. It's like going to, I don't, you know, Westworld, and somehow I traveled back in time, and I'm, I'm seeing all the decor. It brought back a uh, park. There was a barber shop in the book. And I think Bob that, you know, that if Harry, that you base it in a maternity ward, you place. And in many ways, he was uh, he was dead right. That's part of how the world combination of what the Reverend Bill Graham said. All right. Uh, Dan, uh, could you uh, come out and come back in for a second? You're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, um, one thing I do want to ask, ask him um, when he comes back is just right. um, this experience of growing up and seeing all the changes at the Astrodome. And uh, so and what what has he heard about the changes of um, what the, what the plans are for the Astrodome? Because I don't know if he has any insight. I mean, I, I've, there's been so many changes over the years about what's going to happen to Astrodome. And so, Dan, uh, do, do you know what's uh, in the plans for the Astrodome? So there's an Astrodome Conservancy, which is doing everything they can to protect the history of the dome. And there are some developers who have emerged in recent um, months that have been working behind the scenes with uh, our friends at City Hall and with our friends at Harris County, just as important, maybe more important, and the Texans and the rodeo. So to build that kind of support really requires a whole lot in the way of, of discussion. And those discussions have been extremely positive. I will say that I was really encouraged by one little random event that occurred recently that involved the Texans in the rodeo where a gentleman uh, by the, by the, who goes by 50 Cent came in and made a bid on a bottle of champagne or something. And someone who is associated with that um, is a highly credible developer and uh, person of influence in the city uh, who loves the city the way my grandfather did and has a magnificent idea that's really consistent with what I said back when mom and I and a few others, several others, uh, we call ourselves the Alpine Gang, who went to Alpine, Texas and talked about what should happen with the dome. And it wasn't a bunch of tree hugging and it wasn't a bunch of just radical, crazy you know, thought. And it wasn't about making the Astrodome what it once was. It was really about doing something to make the building useful, to make it vibrant and have it integrated into the complex in a way where we don't just keep up with the Joneses. And literally in this case, I refer to Jerry Jones and Jerry World, but we surpass them. So there's a real opportunity um, to significantly assist the rodeo, um, assist the Texans, uh, assist the city with different events. Um, you know, Cynthia, Cynthia Mitchell Pavilion, I guess is what it's called out, out in the woodlands, um, is a nice venue and Toyota Center is an awesome venue. But another venue makes a lot of sense in Houston, a reimagined Astrodome that also has 
additional parking that also has additional shopping and, and food and, and things that you can do from a standpoint of production facilities. And so there's a really bright roadmap for what can happen with the dome that doesn't involve going to taxpayers and digging deep into their pockets and, and forcing some kind of an election that, that nobody wants, uh, especially in this day and age. So I like the plan, uh, I like the momentum, I like the people who are involved just as important. So building that support, having those conversations, having productive dialogue, taking no out of the equation and thinking with the kind of vision my grandfather would have is exactly the kind of thing that would meet with, uh, you know, with the kind of energy that I'd love to contribute. All right, Brett, I know that Den has the A's versus Yankees in the background, and you can't watch that if you don't have direct TV, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, does this sound familiar to you? You got one device and lets you catch all the game live, um, another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you got your neighbor's best friends log in, all the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings you live TV and on-demand favorites together live never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. All righty, Dan, I love your little American uh, map back there with all the license plates. That's a that's an awesome little background back there. So uh, speaking of background, um, I know a lot, a lot of talk right now, especially after Zach Greinke's bad game today, a lot of people are saying, does he deserve to start in the playoffs and i think with his his history in the playoffs i think the answer would be yes what would you think then uh no question i don't even think it's i don't even think it's a hesitation the question is which game do you start him in and i think that the astros have this luxury of looking at a guy like fromber and seeing how 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 more locked in he has been uh, how effective he is at getting ground balls out of hitters and if you have the kind of defense that they have now with the full team intact I think you stick with uh, – you look at Fromber as the guy who's either game one or game two, and you look at Lance as game one or game two, which you, whichever way you're going to flip that. And Grinky coming in as a game three starter-ish um, could be extremely effective. But I don't believe that there's any chance that they're, that they're not going to make him a starter. When he, first of all, Dusty thinks the world of him. Right. And, and second, Grinky's a smart cat. I mean, I think a lot of people were nervous about him in, in game seven against the Nationals. And now everybody, in, in hindsight, is wishing that he had been left in for at least one more batter. So you talk about somebody who does have a knack for coming up big because he's so thoughtful out there, and he's a he is a he is a cerebral pitcher. Uh, he's a person who thinks like a general manager when he's on the mound. Uh, he's done all of his homework. He's the type of guy who, when he comes out of an outing, is going to sit there and still work with his catcher and still talk about the things that could have been handled differently. Um, you're talking about a guy who can be a pitching coach and can be a GM when his playing days are over, and that's what he does when he's out there on the bump. So I, I, I firmly believe that he'll either be the Game 3 or Game 4 starter. Yeah, see, I think if if you were to ask me, if you were to give me the ability to write the four-man rotation, um, I would go with Lance McCullers, one, Framber Valdez, two, Luis Garcia, three, and Grinky four. And with Grinky, you could piggyback Urquidy with him. You could even piggyback Odorizzi with Garcia if you needed for some reason. But I think Zach Grinky is your fourth starter. But I think Dusty, being Dusty, goes Grinky one, McCullers two, Valdez three, and Garcia four. Yeah, I don't think he'll do that because I do believe he'll get the lefty in either one or two. Um, and, I, and I believe that Click and Click and Stromy will have significant input right. as to that as well. And dep again, depends on the matchup too. When you're facing the Yankees, you're going to want Fromber in one or two without any right. question in my mind. And if you I also – and you look at Garcia, Garcia has been, you know, terrific. I mean, you're, you're dead right that he easily could be the three. It just depends on on what the, what the matchups suggest, how he is at that point from an innings count. And, and not even to, to dismiss um, – to dismiss the coffee, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on on Mr. Coffee. Um, the uh, star, Christian Javier, Javier. Yeah, yeah, Christian Javier, Christian Javier. You know, he can go tandem as well, which is pretty fascinating. And he's actually better starting than he is probably coming in. He at least needs to come in clean. 
And we saw what happened when he came in during an inning and gave up a grand slam. Um, that was uh, that was a rough moment. So he, they're all learning a lot about this staff right now and figuring out who they can and can't depend on. And I would say that Mr. Abreu um, pretty much answered the <laughs> emphatically that he's not really part of the equation in the postseason. Well, technically, uh, Brayu hasn't really pitched in a long time because oh. he, he was part of the taxi squad, and he was and he still kinda... and he still had and he still hasn't pitched in a long time. Yeah, I, I know. Think he can count today as pitching. <laughs> yeah, that was more batting practice. I get what you're saying, but Zach Greinke after a game, he was like, "When I feel good, it usually works out, and I get outs." So not too concerned about stuff and location. It was just one of those days where the other team was just locked in. And Zach Greinke on uh, Jake Myers' catch, it was amazing. Defense played amazing behind me. It was a, wasn't a was a couple of really good plays. It would have been even worse than it was. Yeah, I mean, we can say that about Farmer Valdez. Uh, like, remember that uh, when the runner ran on the inside of the line? If, if it wasn't for the umpire calling him out, that game could have been different. There's a lot of ways where this today's game could have been different. I know we could have been talking about a perfect game if from or if um, Jordan Alvarez didn't hit that foul ball home run. Because who wouldn't who would have known the momentum may have turned a little bit with that turn because uh, the next hitter got a hit, which, which was Alex Bregman. But uh, who knows how things could have changed with uh, just one swing in a bat. Well, and going back to Friday night, uh, you know, the, the, the Rangers took out their, their, their Houston area kid who was pitching mm -hmm. lights out and the Astros really yeah. benefited from the fact that they didn't want him to go beyond those, beyond that, uh, that five innings. So exactly. Yeah. And you know, there are a lot of people that were worried about, they're like, Oh, see, I told you Grinky's not, doesn't have it. And, or someone, I saw someone make a comment, you know, we, we really got snowed on the, on the Grinky trade. And I'm like, someone's like, Josh Rojas is killing it. And I'm like, but what Josh Rojas would be offering at 278 isn't the value of guy that's 11 and four pitching. I mean, we have, if you, if you look at our pitching staff, um, our pitching staff has allowed the fewest runs, 506 before today. Before today. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, while also leading the, 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 uh, the, the AL in ERA and opponent batting average and opponent OPS. And so this this is no, like, you just kind of ignore pitching staff. We may not have the power of the White Sox or what other clubs have, but I still think this club is very equipped to not only make a long playoff run, but to be the AL representative in 2021. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you're talking about, first of all, they're not going to play in a wild card game um, unless the bottom just falls out from here in these last, last, uh, last weeks. And so you're looking at the Red Sox, the Yankees, possibly, probably, maybe playing each other. One of those teams is going to be gone. Um, you know, you're, if you're in the Derby of four teams trying to get to the, the World Series, and the Astros certainly have shown uh, that they have this staying power despite the noise and nonsense, they have a, you know, an amazing opportunity to get there. They, they know how to play matchups. Uh, they know how to exploit weaknesses of lineups. Uh, the White Sox have shown just this weekend, you know, they got, they got Lance Lynn got drilled by the Cubs on Saturday. So you just, anybody can go out and lay an egg. Uh, you know, you're facing Garrett Cole. If, they, if the Yankees get through and you got to face Garrett Cole and he pitches the way he did in that game at Minute Maid Park, you know, that's a problem. But they don't have a lot else that scares the heck out of people. So then you're really not worried until, you know, obviously you worry about every game. Um, you don't take any of them for granted. But then you're looking at a World Series where you just don't want to have to face that crazy pitching staff the Dodgers have put together um, until you get bullpen but the starting staff they have is just you know, ridiculous but you know the best teams don't always get there the Astros seem to be a get there kind of a club uh, they've definitely proven that the last three years and I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't do it this year all right after the start today I felt like giving Zach Grinke a belt bar maybe uh, Brian and Bray you needed one just like here here's a belt bar Brett tell us a little bit about belt bar Look, I love Built Bar. I don't know if it gives you control on the mound, but I know for me it helps me control my weight. So, therefore, they have all these delicious flavors. It is a chocolate bar wrapped in 100% chocolate. Most bars have 17 to 18 grains of protein. Um, calories ranging from 130 to 180 and only 45 grams of sugar, 45 grams of net carbs. All tasty, always healthy, amazing flavors like grasshopper cookie or raspberry, whatever you like. And the Built Bar is official protein bar of the USA track and field team of NCAA football teams and 
Locked On Astros host as well. If you follow me on Twitter, you've seen the pictures of my fridge. You've seen the amount of built bars in my fridge, and I swear by them, they are great. Don't try any other protein bar. If you bought it, give it to your friend so that you can benefit from built bar. Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your first order. Built.com. Tell them H-Town Wheelhouse sent you. I remember at one point during the season, we were betting on whether who would finish with more home runs, Jose Altuve and uh, Jordan Alvarez. It looks like uh, betonline.ag would probably would said Alvarez. Tell us about BetOnline. Yeah, so BetOnline is your online sportsbook experts. And as everybody's turning their eyes to football, we know in Houston, the Astros are where it's at. But the Texans are trying to surprise people. Are they going to go 0-17 and go for that first pick? Or are they going to surprise everybody and win five games? Who knows? The gridiron is back, and I know we're ready for it. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all pro and college football action this season. Get all the uploaded odds, um, props, and contests, including online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest 200,000 NFL survivor contest open now at Bet Online. Head to the website to use your mobile device and sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus. 100% of what you deposit will be added to your account. Be sure to take advantage of the opening day super promo. Make a bet on the Thursday, September 9th season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and the Dallas Cowboys. And if you lose, your wage will be refunded up to $25 for new customers only when signing up using the promo code NFL 100. From football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available in the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Use the promo code Locked On. Thoughts by Dusty. All right, here is Dusty Baker on Jake Myers' catch. He thinks he should catch them all. Uh, Dusty Baker on Zach Greinke. It was a bad day for Zach. He was down the heart of the plate more than he normally is. And this is Dusty Baker on Brian Abreu. Abreu had a real tough day finding the plate. It was a tough day on him, a tough day for us. And uh, afterwards, he pointed out that Kendall Graveman and Ryan Presley were not available today. So basically, uh, it was a rough day. And uh, on Alvarez, he said, he's swinging a very good bat right now. He's hitting the ball hard. He should have a dynamite finish. Who uses the word dynamite? I mean, <laughs> who uses dynamite anymore? That's like a, from the um, seventies or something. I say dynamite. You don't say. Come on, you don't say dynamite, Eric. I'm joking. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't either. So, so uh, now that the boys are back together, then <laughs> do the Astros have a dynamite lineup to get ready to, for the playoffs? You know, the reason I say the reason I'm going to defend the word dynamite, not just because of Jimmy J.J. Walker back on the show that good times that perhaps Dusty is channeling and recalling because it was a it was a heck of a show. And by the way, tipping my cap to Ed Asner, who passed away today. Uh, it was awful news. Played Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler Moore show. I'm dating myself when I reveal my affinity for him, but he did play Santa Claus in Elf. So so for for you, you kids out there. Ed Asner uh, was a great man, and, and he was from that era of dynamite uh, being referenced. But so when he when he called the when he said the big orange wagon, which I like a lot less than dynamite. Uh, so I've always thought of this team as a blast, and I think that the word blast really applies to them really well. And I picture this orange explosion that they're they, that's what they are to me. They're just the orange blast, and I think that the thing about this team that is a blast to me is that they have this electricity in them. And I think when they're when the energy is low, just kind of contagious. When they have a low energy game, it just infiltrates that entire lineup and the entire roster. It's just it's wild. But because when they're on, they're just unbeatable. You know, and if you watch enough of the other teams, and I watch all of them as much as I can, and some of you are watching games, I'm just a fiend. I was watching that White Sox Cubs game. And so I'm you know, I'm watching these games and I'm seeing this same thing, and it's sort of like, man. Y'all pay attention to what's going on here because the fact they don't have Springer, they don't have Verlander, they don't have Cole, they don't have all of these things, and yet they still have this up and down that lineup, this this sort of magical connectivity between players. And, and Michael Brantley showed a lot in his post-game interview with Julia Morales a couple nights ago where he was just happy. The guy was just flat happy, and he also, with the, you know, his stone-cold serial killer kind of, you know, more than a serial killer, more of sort of a hired gun, hitman kind of a look, would basically look. 
we weren't going to get too high about this one. We're going to get too low about the next one. We, we every, every game is a reset for us, and we're just it's every at bat is being cliche. Dusty's cliche are a little dated sometimes, um, but there are teams that just they're all on the same page. But that includes when they struggle, and you just hope they don't get into a situation where they have a struggle. But to me, it's when they need to get up, they're up. And you don't get down for the playoffs. And that's really been the thing that was really amazing about last year's team. Look at what a horrible struggle that they had going in. And who was, you know, they did go in and beat the Twins. And that didn't surprise a lot of people. But the way they just, you know, manhandled the A's was was so impressive. You're just sort of like, whoa, they flipped a switch. So this is a team that is capable of flipping a switch. And this year, they don't have to flip it quite as hard. They just need to make sure that it stays up near 9 and 10 and doesn't fall down around 5, 6, or 7. So when you talk when you talk about flipping a switch, I'm reminded my childhood watching Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone, one of the best worst movies of all time, where he is an arm wrestler and he talks about he he he's he's sitting in front of this truck. They're they're all competing in this arm wrestling tournament for this Volvo truck, and he's like, when I when I turn my hat around, it's like it's like I become a machine, like 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 this flip. You know, I flip a switch and it's like, yeah. And I'm like, he goes and, you know, he beats Bull Hurley and he changes his hand position and overpowers him. Um, a buddy of mine I grew up with, his dad worked on that set. He was he was part of the International Arm Wrestling Federation. He was one of the heads of it. And so he's got pictures. He my friend met Stallone during that whole filming. But but that's what you remind me of. And that's what the Astros are. It's like when I turn my hat around, I become a machine, you know, and they do. They they have a different level, and that is that was built in there, and that was built in that clubhouse when A.J. Hinch was here, and that confidence still is there. I don't know if you heard A.J. Hinch say this the other day. This was awesome. A.J. Hinch was like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we may not be the guys that you're that you're beating right now, but but later on, you you better watch out because we're coming for you. Like, like he's just he's still got that mentality. Mentality's carried over. And you love that about this ball club because through and through, it just goes through. And even the new guys catch it. You know, Graveman, Myers, yeah. all these guys have caught it. They, yeah. You know, it's funny they 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 they, they, they do they, they do follow his lead. Uh, and like you said, the guys who weren't even here under that regime are still catching. You know, the momentum that that regime brought into it. So it's it's very uh, inspired. And what what AJ was doing was sending a message to free agents. And, you know, one of those free agents uh, happens to, or two of them happen to be current Astros. For Justin, who's not, you know, with the team, who could easily go back to the Tigers. And Correa could easily fit in there as like a guy who's going to completely change that culture. But first things first, I am enjoying Correa right now probably more than I ever have. I'm just not, I'm not caught up in the dread of whether he's still going to be there. So anyway, I think it's just, uh, I know we, we were going to uh, lose our, our co-host um, yeah, anyway, you're fine. Cool. We can keep on. We can keep on going. He's got. No, to go he's play. Doing hoops. I still want. I don't want to be hurt. He needs to stretch out and not become. Yeah, he's got to pretend to go play some basketball. He's over there laughing right now in the corner. So yeah. make sure you close yeah. yourself out and go uh, miss some baskets. Make sure you don't pull a hammy. No, he's gonna. He's <laughs> so. gonna focus on. He's gonna focus on the bottom of the net, man. I'm telling you, he, he's gonna score twenty yeah. tonight. So I know that uh, Chaz McCormick is going to play some rehab games with El Paso uh, in El Paso for Sugarland Skeeters Monday and Tuesday. He could be activated as soon as Friday. I know that uh, we have Jose Arquiti making his final start for the Skeeters in El Paso, which is a long, long drive. I almost said that word, but it's a long drive even from um, Arlington. So um, uh what do you think of Chaz Wait a minute. Is he driving? Are they driving to El Paso? I'm sure they're, they're flying. I'm sure they're yeah, flying. Yeah, no, no, no. But... I, you know, I got a ticket once in Fort Stockton going 83. And now, sadly, 83 might be the speed, you know, 85 might be the speed limit. So that was that was a long, long time ago. Uh, it's yeah. a long trip. It's a long trip to El Paso. Urquidy is uh, a great secret weapon. So a lot of people forget, you know, that he's even there and and there is a resource. Uh, but he's uh, he's quite talented. If, he, if he's gotten his arm kind of rested and, and re-energized, he was pitching really well for, us for a brief stretch there. Um, so he could be really helpful. And as we remember, he did extremely well against the Nationals in that World Series as well. Uh, pitched one hell of a game. I know a lot of people just look right past him when they're talking about the, the playoff rotation. I mean, this guy has some great playoff games. Um, Luis Garcia, as great as he's been, he's only pitched in two innings in the playoffs. So yeah, I think that Dusty Baker being Dusty Baker, he's going to go with the experience and he's going to 
go with Urquidy as long as he's built up enough innings. And so we'll, we'll have to see how many starts he can get over the next um, month because that's basically all he's got. So that's probably what three, four starts that he's got with the Astros. So we'll see. And uh, Chaz McCormick uh, is, has enough time to try to win his job back from Jake Myers because a lot of people have said that he's been Wally Pipped. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's the case. I think that it's probably still going to be some type of a platoon. But uh, we saw shades of Jake Marisnik out there making that catch today. He's been uh, ma- doing some great swings. What have you seen from Jake Myers in his limited playing time? Well, Myers is a guy that they're high on because of his defense. They drafted him because of his defense. They, they thought his offense might come, and it has, it has definitely uh, done so like gangbusters. So Myers is, to me, the better player in terms of just it always had been kind of his ranking and the expectation was that he could become an everyday type of player and that Chaz would be a, a fourth outfielder, maybe even a fifth outfielder, but, but a damn good one. And he also can demonstrate that versatility. Who knows what else they're going to do with him? He has shown such uh, grit and such uh, determination and conviction and the ability to, to make contact, uh, even in tough circumstances, I think that's been impressive by both those guys, that they've actually fit into and bought into this system of this club that really strives and values having quality at-bats, not giving up a single pitch. And they've both shown great ability to do it. Myers is the better defender. Their offense is somewhat similar, but Myers seems to have more power to all fields. So you got a guy with foul pole to foul pole power who's in a groove, um, I wouldn't say that you could say that either one of them at this point of their lives would even, you know, be Wally pipped. Cause I think the, the person who's going to Wally pip them is in the minors right now. And, and so they've, they've got some, some even better help, uh, coming right. that did not part with at the trade deadline. I mean, guys who are going to make people not miss Springer so much, and maybe even not miss Correa if he happens to go, which I guess he will. Um, there's a lot of help coming. And meanwhile, I just think that they have an embarrassment of riches to some extent, and what they need is just to is to keep uh, keep clicking the way that they do when they are up, and they're going to score a lot of runs even against really good pitching. Well, a lot of people say that the the weakness of the 2017 roster was the bullpen because they had to rely a lot on their their starters uh, like the Charlie Mortons and Lance McCullers to kind of close out the the games of the World Series. Do you think that this bullpen is stronger than the 2017 bullpen was? I think it's stronger because of what they can put in there. So, they, so you can put a guy like Christian Javier in there to basically be tandem like. You can put someone like Urquidy there who can be tandem like. You can even put Garcia there who can be tandem like. Really, depending on what kind of rotation they go with and how the weather's cooperating and how many days off they're going to have between games. But when you know that you can throw Lance out there and and you know that you can um, that you can throw Fromber out there and then you've got a choice between Garcia and Urquidy and Granky to be the right. to be the next starter. Uh, that's great depth. And your question was about the bullpen. The guy I worry a little bit about is Maton. Uh, he's got tough. He's got that whole spin rate thing going down. But he's almost like. Uh, Presley, when he got here, uh, Presley was really good when he got here, I think that, but he wasn't this great, elite, amazing, no brainer future closer. Um, Maton's got some work to do, but I think between what they have at the back end and Stanek and Graveman and Presley, if you can get those guys seven, eight, nine, um, and Stanek can just can stay within himself, that's a pretty amazing seven, eight, nine. So now you're only talking about a starter having to get through a lineup twice, a bridge guy having to get through a lineup once, and these other guys just shutting it down completely. Um, it's encouraging. It's encouraging. Uh, you know, you can, any team can slump at any time and it really depends right. on what the heck their matchup is. Uh, but I do like their chances, uh, especially with, uh, with the depth that they do have in that bullpen. It, Stan at Graveman and Presley is not something they had in any of those three years coming up to this. And, you know, you could already, so when they brought in, um, when they brought in, uh, Yimmy, was it? Yeah. When they brought in Yimmy, it's another guy we haven't really talked about. And he's better than Maton. Uh, so, right. you know, so now you're talking, you can split seven, split seven based on matchup and then go eight, nine with Graveman and, and, um, and Presley and you're in really great shape. So I think it's a pretty amazing collection of talent that they've got. And there, there could be argument uh, to put on Odorizzi in, on the roster, not to be a starter, not to be a reliable member of the bullpen, but let's say that a uh, Zach Greinke gets shelled early. 
you need somebody to kind of eat up some innings so you don't waste the, your valuable arms in a bullpen. So that's something that the mop up guy, and that's the role that I've, I've been uh, saying on Twitter. But I'm not saying. Well, you know, it's funny. There, there was a crazy game in the in the World Series between the Phillies and the Rays, and I was at that game, and it was one of the major rain delays, and it went on forever and ever. And you know, a guy like Joe Blanton all of a sudden had a place right. and was a guy a dude who got it done. And so those are sometimes those people that you need in a random game that somehow is going to look like a, look like a softball game. And it's going right. to be one of those, you know, nine right. to eight or 12 to 12 to nine type of scores. And he could be really useful. The weird thing about him um, is that his second time through the order seems to be really polished, really effective. And, and it's that first time where sometimes he can be shaky. Um, so you almost want him to like, go pitch in the bullpen for about three innings and then just come out, come in hot and give, give us one track through the order. Uh, because Odorizzi, he clearly, he does have stuff. Uh, but if he leaves it up there and in the wrong place, he just gets, um, he just gets right. crushed. Well, depending on what's going on in the game behind you right now, I know the Astros have a six game lead over the A's right now. The, they have a 7.5 game lead over the Mariners right now, but they're going to Seattle to play three games and then they have an off day. So I know the Astros historically have played really well, well in Seattle. And so I think that with Luis Garcia on the mound, he's going to be, be facing Chris, uh, Chris, Chris uh, Flexen. I know this is a guy the Astros have played really well against. I'm, I'm looking at the lineup, and only Yuli is struggling with a 167 batting average uh, against him. Everybody else is, uh, has had a great season against him. So uh, I'm, I think this is going to be a great series. The Astros will be looking to make, a, make some noise. And it's not, I don't think this game, this uh, 13 to 2 or 3, whatever this, this last game was, I don't think that's going to be too much on their mind. I don't think it's going to be on Zach Greinke's mind. I think he's already thinking about the next start. Uh, what can I do to get better? But um, uh, tell tell me, what are you up to right now? Now that the, the that um, the Hall of Fame uh, weekend was over, what's next uh, for Den Man? So first of all, on cue, Tony Kemp was the guy who got the hit. So it's one to one. Tony Kemp got a solo. Okay. You know, Astros, Astros helping Astros, and so Tony Kemp got a single. Uh, I say helping Astros. It's hard to root for the Yankees to some the rivalry there. So I, I have known what to do with that series. I've, I've been happy either way. I've been mad either way. Um, right. You asked what uh, yeah, what I've been doing. And so I'm working on a, a, a concept and Dusty Baker happens to be involved with it. So Dusty, Dusty's a bit of an entrepreneur. As you, as entrepreneurs, a lot of people may, may not realize, but he's got Baker Family Wines. He's got um, an energy company that he works with and and he is a really a man for all seasons. I mean, he's kind of like, uh, you know, Walter Mitty. He's just, he's just living, living, living the dream really at this point. And so he's one of the partners uh, in a group that I'm associated with that, that, I'm, that I'm a partner, partner of. Uh, and we ha have a, a company called GoatNet that I'm working on. And GoatNet is really a streaming idea that uh, is much more than that because it involves really like immersive next level storytelling and backstories around sports and content associated with sports and athletes. And as you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world where things like John Boy have popped up, things like Barstool have popped up, and The Ringer was really first to that party doing some really exciting things that were, that were fairly disruptive. But none of them have done it really totally from the standpoint of like the sports figures and the people who are in the game and associated with the game. And you see how fired up these athletes get about like the T-shirt with, uh, you know, with Fromber on it that the guys are wearing or Michelle. Teddy being in his pose and the, and that comes out of something like that. And it's true of content as well. So whether Bregman's also are doing his little bit with the, with the shtick in the bar with, uh, with some of his teammates, um, there's a lot to be said there for content development related to human interest in sports, but not just in sports, just around the theme of greatness, which is why I chose the moniker GoatNet. So I'm really excited about some businesses that we've identified that are already up and successful and profitable that we can piece together to form a really exciting opportunity that can have a major flag in the planet right there in Houston, Texas. So I'm, I'm super enthusiastic about associated with every part of this equation that it takes to build that up. And I spent, I spent 17 years at MLB, um, working at MLB advanced media, inventing things like Statcast and, and things like MLB.tv and, uh, trying to you know solve the problems associated with blackouts and associated with streaming and associated with 
working with other partners to make their content available. So it's not my first rodeo, um, so to speak. And a lot of it, you know, stems from my early days growing up, being around the Astrodome and having a grandfather who thought the way he did. I'm really genuinely fired just by the chemistry that I see on Twitter, but some of the, some of the Twitter, you know, the frustration you have a little bit where you're following all these people and they're all interested maybe in certain pockets of things. And it's not necessarily compartmental, compartmentalized as effectively as it could be. But so there's so much great content going on around sports and people who have things to say and can bring a lot of assets and value to the party and the conversation. We've got a real shot to organize something around athletes and their influence. Um, So it's been, you know, it's been a fabulous, you know, awesome, awesome situation. So that's what I'm up to now. I might've lost you for a second. So I'm going to jump out and jump back in. Sorry about that. My computer some, somehow um, went out. So I wasn't sure if I was going on once you disappeared. Um, yeah. You know, but go I, ahead. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I felt like I was walking the plank, and I'm like, I don't, I'm not really sure exactly what's supposed to happen here, but I don't, I don't want to go falling into the into the yeah. grim sea. So sorry about that. So go ahead, and that'll be a weird. I've been around <laughs> some companies in Houston. I've been up and run, run by. Great yeah. So in here, so, and um, yeah, sorry about that, great. guys. It's great. So look, they're, they're really tough. So when are you looking at getting this all up? And I mean, I know you said some some parts of it are already up and going, but when do you think it's going to be all up and going? This fall. Um, this fall, we're, we'll make okay. an announcement and have some exciting stuff to share with everybody and. Some really cool people involved that will be recognized, recognizable names that also um, well. Okay, cool. Alrighty, uh, well, guys, uh, thank you all for tuning into the live interrupted <laughs> Locked On Astros podcast. Where's my window closed for some reason? Uh, Dan, thank you for joining, and you're welcome to join whenever if you uh, during the playoffs. If you want to come talk about the um, uh, playoff games, you're welcome. Come join. This was great. And um, uh, once again, where can they find you on Twitter? Find me at Moose Out Front on Twitter, and uh, yeah, every game. I'm, I, I, there's, I, I make my presence known at least for a little bit every game, and try not to turn off the people who follow me for other reasons. But you know, you, when when you watch every game, it's it's hard to resist when you got that thing in your holster. Right. All righty, guys. Yeah. Thank you all for tuning in, and don't forget to go check out the Locked On Bets podcast. Um, the uh, they have all the bet betting information you can use, and don't forget to go subscribe to Locked On Astros podcast on. YouTube and Ghost Rose, and we'll have another game tomorrow. And uh, Brett and I will be doing probably a very late night game tomorrow. I'll probably have to come home and take a nap, and then we'll do another uh, late show tomorrow. So, Ghost Rose, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.